Okay, Acts chapter 28. And I think this is the last chapter in the book of Acts. Last time I looked, this is it. I'm on page, in our notebooks, on page 305. If there's a message in the book of Acts that just rings clear, that stands out among all the messages in the book of Acts, it's keep the main thing the main thing. We've gone from Acts chapter 1 to the end of Acts chapter 28. We've covered a period of about 35 years of history. And what was important in Acts chapter 1 and before is still equally as important in Acts chapter 28. Keep the main thing the main thing. If there was, if there was an Acts chapter 29, and maybe we're writing that chapter right now in modern day Christianity, we would have to keep the main thing, the thing that was important to the apostles and to the disciples in the early church should be the same things that are important to us living in the 21st century. So keep the main thing the main thing. Page 305, not a single soul was lost on the ship that endured a powerful storm in a devastating shipwreck. God's promise went fulfilled to the end. Here in the closing chapter of Acts, we find further evidence that God is true to his word and makes good on his promises. Paul will arrive safely at Rome, where he will stand before the highest and most honorable of human courts, Caesar's throne. Though the book of Acts comes to a close here, the story of the gospel does not end. In fact, in much the opposite way, the end of Acts is just the beginning for God's people. So what does the book of Acts leave us with to take for future generations? We are left with the example of the Apostle Paul who continued amidst imprisonment, storms, shipwrecks, many other seeming insurmountable difficulties to preach the gospel that proclaims the kingdom of God and the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we learn anything from 28 chapters of the book of Acts, we learn that we are to keep the main thing, the main thing. So let's go to chapter 28. Let's pick up our reading, if we might, in chapter number 1. Page 306 in your notebook. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang in his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth him not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while, and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed, laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us or loaded us down with such things as were necessary, obviously, for their trip. So the uh, soldiers, the prisoners, the captives, uh, the uh, navigators, the sailors, they get a very positive welcome here on Melita, Malta, modern-day Malta. They're received very well. And can you imagine going through the tempestuous storm that they have just survived for the length of time that they were 
in that storm and then coming to a place where people literally said, we'll take care of you. We'll minister to you. We'll take care of all your needs. We want you to be warm. We want you to be comfortable. We want you to be well fed. And as, uh, you know, Paul had, had prophesied, he said, you stay in the ship, there'll be no harm that will come to any one of you. Stay with it. And boy, there was no harm. Not only that, they all came ashore. And then they got a, almost a hero's welcome, if you please. So we pick up our reading in uh, verse number 11 on page number 308. And after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux, the twins. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. And from thence, we fetched a compass and came to Regium, and after one day to uh, the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. Remember, that's what this is all about. You now they're taking a roundabout way. This isn't a straight trip on a 747. This is uh, a roundabout way to get to Rome going by sea, we're not going by train, we're not going by plane, we're at the mercy of the elements for sure. And uh, I think I mentioned this last time, the average sailing speed about six miles an hour, you can walk about four miles an hour, so that's not a lot quicker than you could actually uh, walk from Jerusalem or Caesarea uh, to Rome. Think of the time that's taken on a trip like this. Well, anyway, let's uh, pick this up in 15 of 28. And from thence, or from there, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as API Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered, or he was allowed to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. He was in more of a, what you might call a house arrest situation, uh, very uh, um, non-restrictive, unrestrained, on his honor. He's got one soldier watching him that has custody over him, and that's probably because that was the law, that was the minimum, but someone had to be there with him to watch him. And it came to pass, <clears throat> after three days, this is not going to be surprising at all. Paul called the chief of the Jews together, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Remember Romans chapter 10. We uh, t took a moment a couple of sessions ago to read that. Maybe I could read it again for you just to bring it to your remembrance. Romans chapter 10, verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire... And prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul had a passion for the Jewish people. Wherever he went, he, he looked for the Jews. He wanted to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to his brethren, the Jews. All right, let's pick this up then in verse 17 again. Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren... Though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was a delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hand of the Romans. He says, I have no idea. I know why I'm here, but I really didn't do anything wrong. And I have been cleared all along the way. But I appealed to Caesar, and now I am going to get an audience with the number one man. Who? When they examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. This is a theological issue. This is about 
the promises made by the prophets, by the Lord himself to the nation of Israel. And I'm here to say that these promises are in the process of being fulfilled to you. And I've been given the responsibility to be a witness and a spokesman for the gospel. For the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Verse 20, they said unto him, we neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. Why? They just wanted to get rid of him. They didn't have any accusations. What were they going to, what were they going to accuse Paul of? They had nothing to accuse him of. So there's no letters. There's no warning. The people here, uh, the, the Jews in Rome are going, we don't know who you are. We've never heard of you. There's been no letter sent in advance of your arrival so we could be on the lookout for you. Fact of the matter is, is the Jews back in Jerusalem simply wanted to get rid of Paul. If they couldn't kill him, they wanted to ship him. And they did. They shipped him to Rome. So verse 22 says, But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for is concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. This sect is Christianity. He says, we know about Christianity, but we, didn't, we don't know who you are. We didn't know that you were a spokesman. We, didn't, we don't know your background whatsoever. No warning. And when they had pointed him a day, they're going to give him a hearing. Here we go again. He's going to get another hearing. He's going to be witnessing again. They appointed him a day. There came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. And he was well equipped to do this. As a Pharisee, he had a great handle on, in an understanding of the Old Testament scriptures. He also, by this time, were, uh, Paul's been in the ministry now for close to, if not 30 years. He understands the theology. He understands the Old Testament applications and pictures and types. And there isn't anybody on the face of the earth at this time that could stand before the Jewish people and expound upon Old Testament law and bring that whole Old Testament to light in Jesus Christ. So he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus out of the law, out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Verse 24, And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. That's the way it is. Some believe and some believe not. Why? I, why do I believe? And why do I know people who just think it's a um, bunch of poppycock? Foolishness. Why? Why? Thank God. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his word. Thank God for his truth. Some believe not. And when they agreed, not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. This was prophesied in the Old Testament. Some would believe, some would not. The gospel would then go as a light to the Gentiles, not just to Israel, but the rejection of the gospel by the Gentiles would be uh, the open door, or by the Jews would be the open door to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias. Verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed 
and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. He had home Bible studies every day with these people in Rome. Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. And there were hundreds of thousands of people, assuredly, who lived here. And Paul had the opportunity to minister to and affect countless thousands of, him, of them with his testimony, no doubt. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Paul dwelt there two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Well, that is the end of the text of the book of Acts. We leave Paul, or Paul leaves us, doing home Bible studies in Rome. He spends, according to the text, he spent two whole years in his own rented or hired house, and he received all that came in. Remember, there were some Jews that believed and some that did not. And I imagine there were many more that did as time went forward. So we have commentary there on 309, 10, etc. Again, I want to encourage you to take the time to read the commentary. It brings a, maybe a little bit more light to the story. There may be some things that are said in that commentary maybe you just never thought of or considered from the text. But let's go to page 312 and we'll look at the application on page number 312. Christianity is intended for everyone. Think about this, you know. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, the, the last numerical figure that I have heard that I, would have, that I think is credible is that there are about 15 million Jews in the world. Think about that. Jews in the world today. Um... I think it's safe to say that the majority of them are not Christians. You might even laugh at that. Uh, that's for sure that the majority of them are not Christians. 15 million. But let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, 20 percent of them were. Let's say three million Jews actually had come to a place where they accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Let's say that's true. Three million. Think about how many people live in the world today. We're over 7 billion. I've heard the figure that in communist China, China itself, that there are about 100 million believers, Christians, in communist China. And there might be 3 million Jews in the world and 100 million believers just in China itself. And that's in a country that is not pro-gospel for sure. Doesn't have a church in every corner, I can guarantee you that. And uh, radio and TV night and day proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not there. 100 million people. So look what has happened. <clears throat> Going all the way back to this small group of disciples in Acts chapter 1 and and uh, Peter being their leader and preaching in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3 to Israel. And we see Paul everywhere he goes seeking out Jews, trying to bring them to a knowledge of the Messiah. After all these years, how many Jews, now I mean, I, I'm not counting up all the Jews that have been saved through history, but even today, right now, if 20% of those living were converted, that would be 3 million. But look at how many Chinese, Americans, Russians, Australians, Europeans, Africans. We could go on and on and on. Maybe a billion, maybe billions, I don't know. I don't even know how to begin to count a number like that. What happened? What happened to Israel? God is still dealing with the nation of Israel. 
just to end this study with this, this thought, I believe that the, uh, I believe the book of Hebrew, Hebrews was written to give, convince the people that we're talking to or talking about right now, these Jews, these unbelievers, up till 65, 70 A.D. I believe the book of Hebrews was written possibly, probably by Paul the Apostle. He didn't put his name on it purposely because of his reputation, I would guess. But <clears throat> looking at uh, the book of Hebrews, that that book was written specifically to try to convince this group of people that Jesus was the Messiah. Read through that. Why is it written to the Hebrews? Why does it have that title on it? Because if indeed Paul wrote that, he had a passion, Romans chapter 10, for those particular individuals. He had a passion for the Jewish people and tried to win them. Not only did he witness to them, but he wrote to them in a book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God to try to convince them that they have a high priest, that there's a better way than the Old Testament law, that there is a new covenant under the blood of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, many of those people for whom Christ died, they have missed it for sure. Christianity is intended for everyone and continues to make significant efforts to reach Israel because Christianity is the culmination of Israel's hope. Paul is a stellar example of a witness living out his calling despite having suffered unjustly. Again, his obstacles became his greatest opportunities. Good evangelism equals confidence in a readiness to share the gospel wherever you are, as we see with Paul. Good evangelism equals a focus on God and on his kingdom through Jesus Christ. The preaching is Jesus. And an open door to anyone who will listen is an open door to you and to me, to anyone who will listen. Keep the main thing. The main thing. The person of Jesus Christ is the main thing. The message of the gospel is the main thing. The mission to go into all the world and preach the gospel is the main thing to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth, Acts chapter number 1. It's the main thing. The message, the mission, and the ministry of Jesus Christ is the main thing. Acts chapter 28 says, And Paul, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus, no man forbidding him. That's where the book of Acts ends. And that's where I will end this study.